Church, thank you for praying. I know you've been praying for this service all week, and I appreciate so much. And many of you are praying for me, and I, I, I need your prayers. Please do that every week. Pray faithfully and fervently for our church and for me and for our Sunday school teachers, our deacons. And uh, just pray that God would truly meet with us in a special way. A revival would come to this place. I don't mean just to this church. I mean to this area. That God would do what we cannot explain. And people, I praise God we've had many saved this year. But I, I pray that this coming year will be the best year. That many people will come to Christ and, uh, and get right with God and, and, uh, and be faithful and so much more as we see the day approaching. A little Johnny was spending the weekend with his grandmother and <laughs> it was a trying week in kindergarten. His mother decided to take him to the park and it had been snowing all night. And so they go to the park and it's just gorgeous. And his grandmother remarked, doesn't it look like an artist painted this scenery? She said, did you know that God painted this just for you to enjoy? And little Johnny said, yes, ma'am. And he painted it with his left hand. His left hand, why do you say that? Well, we studied in Sunday school that Jesus is sitting on God's right hand. So if you don't get anything else, you learned something just then. Get your Bibles and turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Someone once said, youth is a blunder, manhood is a struggle, and old age is regret. But you know, that sounds sort of negative to me, sort of pessimistic. Uh, but yet there's some people, that's the way they live their life. They just, you know, they look at one day as, as a drudgery and the next day is a drudgery and one day is filled with trouble and the next day is and they just go from trouble to trouble. And um, I don't think that's the way that God wants us to view life. There's a, there's a question that, that people talk about. You hear the phrase, living the good life. Oh, he's living the good life. They're living the good life. And, uh, and you know, what, what does that mean? That's been discussed. Did you know for thousands of years what is the good life? Plato, Socrates, they said living the good life is living the virtuous life, being kind, generous, caring honest, all, all these things. That's the good life. There was another guy named Epicurus. He was another Greek philosopher. And he taught, actually, a hedonism, that life is about pleasure and sex and drinking and food and entertainment. Hedonism is a pursuit of pleasure and self-indulgence. And that's what he taught is living the good life. I think a lot of people today in our culture would say living the good life is having enough money to do whatever you want to do. I think that's where many people are. I mean, having enough money to just travel the world, travel all the time, or not work anymore and just take it easy, uh, or, or enough money to buy whatever house and land and cars, that's living the good life. That's the way a lot of people think. But I don't think that's what Jesus has planned. Um, Matter of fact, he said, lay not up treasures for yourself here on earth. Uh, Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So I'm talking to you today about the life that Jesus wants. Living the good life is, is whatever God wants us to live. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. Would you stand one more time, John 11, and, and let's read about three verses here to start off with. John 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. I want to bring a message entitled, Living the good life. Thank you. Please be seated. You have an outline on the back of your bulletin. 
living the good life. The background here is very simple. There was a family in Bethany right over the Mount of Olives. Three people lived, two sisters and a brother. You're familiar with them, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and good friends with Jesus. He would go there, and they would share meals together, and, and they, he loved them. The Bible says that. He loved them, and they loved him, and, and I think they were close friends. And, and then there was that time that Lazarus gets sick, and so the, the sisters send for Jesus to come so that he would heal the one you love. That's why they say it. And, uh, but Jesus didn't. He didn't come immediately. He tarried uh, for two days. And then he goes. And when he's getting there, Martha comes way out somewhere to meet him when she knows he's getting close and, and says, if you would have been here, he would not have died. And then she goes and she gets uh, Martha, I mean Mary, Mary, and Mary comes to meet him, and she said the same thing. If you would have been here, he would not have died. But Jesus wanted to give some teaching. And so I want to share with you four ingredients necessary to live the good life. I believe everybody in here wants to live the good life. But you've got to make sure you know what the good life is. So number one on your notes there, we need faith in Christ. We need faith in Christ. The Bible says it's impossible to, to please God if you're not living by faith. You don't have faith. Look at verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, there's your faith. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So you see a word, believe, believe, believe. And Jesus says, do you believe? Do you believe what? What do you believe that I am the resurrection? Verse 25. Do you believe that? And do you believe I'm the life? Do you believe that if you, if you trust in me, even if you die, you live? Do you believe that? And do you believe whosoever liveth and believeth, have faith in me, shall never die? I don't know about you. That sounds good to me. You know why? Because I do believe. I have faith. And I can't take any credit for that. I give God all the glory. I'm so thankful for faith. Folks, I've thought of that so many times because I've had people tell me, I wish I believed. I don't believe. I don't have faith. I, again, I can't take any credit for that. But somehow God's given me that faith. You see, every good gift is from God, right? That includes faith. So if you have faith to believe that Jesus lived and died on an old rugged cross, if you have that faith, that's a gift from God. Praise his name for faith that you believe and that you know he's coming back, like we sang about just a moment ago. We need that faith. And that's the, that's the foundation to have this abundant, victorious, overcoming life. It's the foundation of living the good life. When Lazarus came forth, he came forth at the word of Jesus. Jesus prayed, and he prayed out loud. Now, he didn't pray out loud because so that God the Father would hear. Let's look at it, verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Now, he's praying out loud right now. I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by it, Stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Can I say one thing, and I hadn't planned on saying this, but if we have faith, we need to let people know we have faith. If we're Christians, we need to let people know we're Christian. Oh, somebody says, well, I think it's a private thing. I don't believe in public. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I don't believe in public invitation. Oh, well, then you don't believe the Bible. It's a very public thing. Christianity is public. If you're not ashamed of it, let people know. I'm a Christian. That's one of the reasons I like to wear that Father's Day cap that we have. I love Jesus. And people comment on it. And I want them to know I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed. We've got to let our faith show. Now, Jesus raised three people from the dead as far as 
as far as recorded in Scripture. I might have raised many more than that, but we know of three. There's the little girl, I think it's Jairus' daughter. She had just died. He raised her from the dead. And then there was the young man, and they were taking him to bury him, and Jesus raised him from the dead. And then there, Lazarus. And Lazarus had been in the tomb, the Bible tells us, four days. Got a question for you. The little girl just died. The young man died maybe a day or two before. But Lazarus been in the tomb four days. Which one's the most dead? Dead's dead. That's it. Dead's dead. And I ask you that because who's more lost, an atheist or a religious person who never misses church but has never come to Christ? Who's more lost? Lost is lost. You telling me that a mass murderer, a terrorist who's killed many, many people is no more lost than a religious person? Exactly true. If they've never come to Christ, if they've not put their faith and trust in Christ, lost is lost. Ephesians 2, 1 says, You have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. If you know Jesus Christ today, you know him because of faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace just means a gift. It's a, it's a gift you don't deserve. But by faith you're saved, by grace through faith. And so we owe him all the glory for that. Amen? We're coming into thanksgiving. That's one of the biggest things we ought to be thankful for. Salvation. Giving me eternal life. Forgiving me of my sins. Wow. Joe Henderson fought in World War II and Korea. And after the military, he, he, he went to work in, in business and uh, did, did pretty good. But that's not the big deal about Joe Henderson. Joe Henderson came to know Christ. After he got out of the military and got started in business, he, he got saved. And when he got saved, he did what we all should do. He started being very concerned about other people. He had a half-brother that he was very burdened about. He knew he wasn't a Christian, so he went and, and tried to witness to him. By the way, side note, his half-brother had inherited a lot of money, $850 million. I could live off that for a little while. But he was burdened about his brother, and so he goes and witnesses to him, but he, he comes on too strong, evidently. And too aggressive. Sometimes we can do that. And it resulted in a broken relationship. And his brother didn't want anything to do with him. And so they basically didn't, didn't stay in touch because his brother didn't want him coming around. Fast forward 50 years. 50 years. They're now in their 80s. And he found out that his brother had had a massive stroke. So he goes to visit him in the hospital. And very carefully and cautiously, because his brother never wanted him around, but he, he tried to talk with him a little bit and said, hey, would it be okay if I prayed with you, prayed for you? And his brother said, yeah. So he prayed. And then he said, would it be okay if I come back to visit you again? His brother said, yeah. So Joe left. The very next time he came back to see his half-brother, his brother was smiling. And he said, Joe? got good news for you I'm born again I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ boy was Joe glad to hear that the interesting thing though Joe had not ceased to pray for his half brother for 57 years 57 years he wouldn't give up if there's somebody you know is lost don't give up keep praying great verse Matthew 21 22 it says listen and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer listen believing you shall receive in faith in faith you got to believe believe not not in your your mental uh, uh, abilities and trying to talk yourself up into it your faith is in Christ. 
Your faith is in the word. We talked last week about those promises. You got to find the promises. Hold on to them. Not demanding God to do anything. Be careful there. But in humility, asking him to answer this promise. So how was Lazarus raised? By the word of God. Jesus said in verse 43, he said, Lazarus, come forth. That's the word of God. Jesus had already said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth or maketh it alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There was life in his word. Can I say there is life in this word? This is the word of God. This is it. Stay with it. Study it. Read it. Meditate. Memorize. Listen. Listen to it. And then use it to witness. All right, number two. So we need faith in Christ. Number two, we need freedom. We need freedom in Christ. You're going to have to listen a little bit faster now. We need freedom in Christ. Look at verse 44. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. Now, before Jesus raised Lazarus, he had no freedom. Actually, he was bound by death. So you have a picture of salvation and the Christian life. You do have a picture, spiritually speaking. Physically is what we're looking at, but you get a picture of the spiritual realm. He had no freedom, and then he got life, but then he comes out, and he's all wrapped right? Like a mummy. He's wrapped. I imagine he kind of hopped out. I don't know. But, but he got out. And, and, and Jesus said, loose him. Loose him and let him go. Set him free. See, many Christians that have been saved and they get bogged down. Somewhere between Calvary and Pentecost. They, in Calvary, Jesus died for us, but Pentecost, Jesus is in us. And sometimes we just don't have liberty. We don't have freedom. The Christians, too. I'm talking to Christians, I think, for the most part. Christians sometimes don't have liberty. Uh, what, what, what do you mean? Well, we've still got the grave clothes on. Grave clothes of sin. Grave clothes of, of the world. Some people are just mixed up in the world. Grave clothes of the flesh. And uh, God wants us to be free. Loose him and let him go. When Lazarus had those grave clothes on, he wasn't fit for anything. I mean, he, he's, he's alive. But he wasn't fit for walking or working or witnessing. He needed to be set free. My question to you today, do you have freedom? we got to get rid of some things in our life if we're going to truly live the good life. James 1.21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That's unnecessary things, wickedness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Are you still wrapped up in old habits? Old language? Folks, there's some things that I hear Christians, and they're professing Christians, and I'm, I'm not going to doubt they're saved. But when we get saved, we're to put that stuff off. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Take all these things off. We don't do that anymore. And then, there's, then he lists other things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. I've heard people try to defend, you know, God's not interested if we've got a potty mouth. He's not going to worry about that. I think he is. I, I, think it, I think it blows your testimony as a Christian. There's no place for it, folks. I don't want to be mean or cruel, but if you're still involved in that, confess it, repent, turn away from it. Don't do that anymore. That hurts your own testimony. John 8, 32 says, you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you what? Free. 
John 8, 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We're to exhibit freedom in Christ. And, you know, the Bible says in Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made, set you free. <laughs> be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So we need faith in Christ. We need freedom in Christ. Number three, put this one. We need fellowship with Christ. If we're going to live the good life, we need fellowship with Christ. Go to chapter 12. I think you're in 11. Go to 12. Look at verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So he was raised from death. He was loosed. And now he's feasting at the table. He's gone from, from the tomb to the table. He's fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's enjoying the Lord Jesus Christ. See, right there. Again, Christian, listen, sometimes we're not enjoying the Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved, but we're not fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not a funeral. Salvation's a feast. And we're to be living and enjoying Christianity. It's not just for heaven. Hey, look, I'm looking forward to heaven. But God wants me to enjoy now, today. This is the only day I got. We talked about that Wednesday night. Today, today, it's all I got. I'm to live it with the Lord, fellowshipping with the Lord. There's people I've come across many times, and I'm sure you have. They're afraid to get saved because they think they're going to lose all the fun. They don't want to give it up. They want, they want to keep drinking. They want to keep swearing. They want to keep going to wild parties. They want to stay in immorality they you know they, they they don't want to lose all that that's that's what they consider fun can i tell you something all the people that believe that have bought into the lies of satan because it's just not true psalm 84 11 listen this is what god says no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly and another one i just quoted every good gift good gift See, Satan wants the bad things for us. And God wants the good things for us. The devil wants to intercept all the good things. It's so sad that many people, even after they get saved, want to remain with the grave clothes. They want to stay in bondage. Can you imagine Lazarus comes hopping out of that tomb Jesus said, loose him and let him go. And Lazarus says, no, 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 I like, uh, I like it in here. I don't stay in here. It's cozy. Yeah, it's crazy. Those filthy grave clothes. Yet that's how sometimes Christians are doing. Christians, talking about people that have been saved. They want to stay with a foot in the world and the flesh doing things that they did in the other life and, 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 and they're not putting the old man to death I said this a million times but whichever one you're feeding gets stronger old man or new man you still got the old man you will till you get to heaven the old man is the flesh things the things that you tend to you did before and you still want to do because the flesh and the world is pulling on you that's the old man. Whatever you feed, if you feed on the wrong movies, the wrong books, and the, the wrong jokes, and the, and, and the wrong crowd, and you feed on that, that gets more dominant in your life, stronger. And the new life gets weaker. What are you feeding? You stay in the Word, stay in prayer, stay with Christians, stay in church. This gets stronger. And the old man, the flesh, gets weaker. Where are you? Where are you on? We all have that battle going on. So
So we're going to live the good life. We need faith. We need freedom. We need fellowship. And lastly, we need faithfulness. Faithfulness to Christ. You're in John 12, look at verse 9. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only. Yeah, they wanted to see Jesus. But that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Do you see what's going on here? People are coming from far and wide. They want to see Lazarus. Yes, they want to see Jesus. But they want to see Lazarus. Lazarus is evidence for Christ. Lazarus is a great witness for Christ. And many were getting saved. So this is a big deal. They want to be around Lazarus. He had a supernatural life in him. And they couldn't explain that away. They knew he had died. And now he's back to life. Now the chief priest, and they, this is just crazy. They want to put Lazarus to death. I mean, you can imagine Lazarus. Been there, done that. Not really worried about it. But that's the devil's crowd for you, you know. Satan wants to stop what God wants to do and what God is doing in people's lives. <laughs> you know, the best argument for Jesus is life. Life. You know, the best argument against Jesus oftentimes it's a Christian. It's a Christian who still got the grave clothes on. The grave clothes of the world. And people don't even know they're Christian. Can't tell the difference. They look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, go to the exact same places the lost people do. We've got to put off the grave clothes. Let me close with this. Years ago, there was a town drunk by the name of Al Cross. Al Cross, everybody knew who he was. I mean, his routine was this. He would work all week, get enough money. Then soon as Friday afternoon, and he's done with work, he would head to the bar, and he would drink. And boy, could he drink. And he would drink. And he would drink. He would drink until he passed out, fell off the, the bar stool, and they would drag him into... A, a, a little room there and he'd sleep it off and this went on and on for months and months and years and one day Al Cross got enough he had enough he was sick of himself he was sick of his life he was sick of of the routine hurting empty inside and so you know what he did he went to a church. He sought out the preacher. He said, preacher, I need help. He said, I've done the AAs. I've done all that stuff. None of it has helped me. I need help. The preacher shared Jesus Christ. Shared how if he would put his faith and trust in Christ, he could have a new life. He could be born again. Al Cross got saved. He got saved, and then he did what all of us should do. He started telling people about Jesus. I mean, this town drunk, everybody knew him. But now he's saved, and man, he wouldn't walk by anybody without sharing Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Have you been saved? And he was just, he was so bold. Well, a little while later, him and some men we're praying and fellowshipping together. And here's the question. It's kind of what I mentioned just a minute ago when I said we need revival in our church, in our area. And so that's what they were talking about. How could we have a true outpouring of the Spirit of God that people get saved and 
and there's a breakthrough with lives being changed on every hand. How could we, what could we do? And one of the men said, I read, if you get the worst sinner in town, in the city, if you can get him saved. Well, they, they started thinking, who is the worst person? Who's the, I don't know that, but I know who the meanest person is. And they all knew who the meanest person was. I mean, he was mean. People were scared of him. He cursed like a sailor. He was a bootlegger, knife fighter, thief, gambler. Everybody was terrified of him. They all knew who it was. They said, man, let's start praying for him. And they did. They just got to serious prayer for this, this guy, this mean guy. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And then they said, okay, we're asking God. We're trusting God. Now we got to go tell this man. Who do we get to go? They said, the preacher. The preacher, he's the one that needs to go. Well, the preacher knew about this, and so he said, okay. And so he went. And uh, he knocked on the door. And the guy was in bed, this mean guy. He had been shot in the hip by his girlfriend. Kind of tells you something there. The preacher went in, and he didn't beat around the bush. He just said, look, I've come to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you how you can be saved, how you can have eternal life. And here's what that mean guy said. He said, if Jesus can do for me what he did for our cross, I want to be saved. It was life, the life of the town drunk who had gotten sold out bold for Christ. Such a change, this mean guy wanted what Al Cross had. Folks, people watching our lives. Now, they may not pay a whole lot of attention to you if you're not living for Christ. But that's one of the best ways to reach people. It's your life. Are you being faithful to Christ? We need faithfulness if we're going to live the good life. Do you have the good life? You'll never have it until you, first of all, get saved. Secondly, get rid of the grave clothes. The grave clothes of the world, the flesh. Stop flirting with the world. Living the good life. It's a life of faith. It's a life of freedom. It's a life of fellowship. It's a life of faithfulness. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.